Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. We're going to finish up with chapter number 2 tonight. Colossians chapter number 2. Now, we have been recording this, this series on the book of Colossians when we're through. Uh, you can see Brother Ray Law or someone in the sound booth. They'll make sure that you get a copy if you would like to have one. All right, we're in Colossians chapter number 2, and let's begin reading in verse number 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increaseth with the, with the increase of God. Wherefore? If ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using. After the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Now, I don't know about you, but that's some hard reading there. Especially you get to verse number 23. We're going to try to explain it, try to help you understand it just a little bit better. Now, from a child, we're taught to heed warnings. And we're taught to heed warnings on up till we die, till we leave this world. Uh, if you get a bottle of poison, it usually has a skull and crossbones on it. That should warn you that it's poison, not to fool with it, not to take it, not to drink it. You have red lights and railroad lights flashing uh, at, the, at a train station, I mean at an at a intersection of a train. Um, I'll never forget, my, I had a first car I ever owned was a 1965 Rambler. And um, 1965 Rambler Classic, 660. In case anybody wanted to. You had one too, Brother Ron? Okay, all right. Yeah, my first car. Anyway, uh, this, the, the, the little arm was coming down and the, and the red lights was flashing. And I thought that little six-cylinder Rambler could beat it. Anyway, it, 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 it got up there and it stalled. On the, now, this is, this is not a television program. This is real life. And it stalled. And anyway, I, I, I guess I prayed. I wasn't a Christian then, but I'm sure I prayed. And, uh, and put it up in park and cranked it. And as soon as I got it in reverse and got it out of the, off the track, here come that train. Well, if I had have, if I'd have been smart, I would have paid attention to those red lights flashing. You see? And we're all, we have warnings through life. We have warnings through life. Interstate signs of danger and so forth and manhole covers off and just just all kinds of signs pointing to danger warnings are a matter of life and death and we need as a child and growing up we need to have a healthy fear of such warnings but if we're not careful as adults we'll become too accustomed to them now I don't have a I don't have your personal stories all I have is mine but um, I, I I was um, on a flight deck of an aircraft carrier launching aircraft and I had launched so many jets you know we had anything from the A6's brother Ron knows what I'm talking about the A7's and we had the F4 Phantoms with the afterburners on them and we had to you know we just we launched them off I mean all day long from seven o'clock six o'clock that morning till till the sun went down we launched them off had to stay there till they all come in well after launching so many jets off uh, I didn't pay attention to a to a C, uh, I think it was a CJ-30, the mail plane. I believe that's what it's called. Anyway, it had a prop on it. it. It had a prop. And I was wore out that day anyway, and I was just walking down the flight deck, and um, I was so accustomed to the jets, I forgot about the props. And as soon as I got about this far from the microphone to my face, that prop, there was a man that ran, grabbed me by the hair of the head, and, and, and pulled me backwards on the deck. And if he hadn't have done that, I'd have been dead. I wouldn't have been preaching tonight. 
But you, we get so accustomed to things, we don't heed the warning signs. And we need to heed the warning signs. Now, the spiritual life has its dangers and warnings. And the Bible tells me over in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, and verse number 12, Beware lest thou forget the Lord. That's just the first part of that verse. Beware lest thou forget the Lord. So that's a warning sign. Do not ever forget the Lord. Do not become accustomed uh, to everything going well, that you'll forget to pray and you forget to read your Bible or you don't think it's necessary. Don't forget the Lord. Well, the Bible uses the word beware in a lot of places. Jesus used it often. Uh, I don't know how many times he used it, but I'm sure when you read the Gospels, and you, if you have a red letter print Bible, you can look at how many times Jesus uses the word beware. But he says beware in Matthew 7, 15 of false prophets. There's a warning against false prophets. And then, of course, he talks about uh, beware in Mark chapter number 12, verse number 38, of the scribes. And again, uh, them, the scribes and the Pharisees asking you to do things that they don't do. In other words, it's blind leading the blind, lest they both fall in the ditch. So there's a lot of times the word beware is used as a warning. Now, in Colossians chapter number 2, and verse number 8, Paul has already warned us about false teachers. If you were here on Wednesday night and you remember the message in verse number 8, Beware lest any man, verse 8, spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And then if you'll notice in verse 4, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. That word beguile means to delude or deceive. And that word uh, spoil you means to lead away or seduce you. So Paul has already warned us about false teachers. Now, and here in verse number 16 through 23, there's some more warnings that Paul gives us. And we need to heed these warnings. If not, we're liable to walk into the prop. Amen? We're liable to walk into the prop. So heed these warnings. Now, in verse number 16 and 17, the Bible says of Colossians chapter number 2, let no man judge you. Now, here's a warning of legalism. We've been warned of false prophets. Now we're being warned of legalism. When a person adheres to religious rules, especially keeping those things contained in the law, such as verse 16 mentions, holy days and Sabbaths, and I don't have time to look at that tonight, but you can go to the book of Leviticus and you can find the holy days. Uh, if you'll read the whole book of Leviticus and the Sabbaths and different Sabbaths, there's a special Sabbath after the Passover, which would be on Thursday. There's your regular Saturday Sabbath. There's all kinds of holy days mentioned in the book of Leviticus. Did you know there's a lot of legalists that say if we don't worship on these specific holy days, then we're wrong and we're not saved. And there's one religion that says we've gone as far as to take the mark of the beast since we worship on Sunday. You see, they're, they're dividing these days. And the, anyone that does that, they're legalist. And you know what Paul does? Paul warns you against such people. Warns you against such people. Now, and even not only the holy days and the Sabbaths, but what about meat and drink? Meat and drink, for instance, pork and coffee. I like my cup of coffee with my bacon. Amen? Amen. But they'll, they'll, they'll talk about pork and coffee and all this. Somehow, um, adhering to this routine inflates the ego and makes a person content in his self-righteousness. If I don't do it and they do it, that means I'm a better person than they are. Well, that's not right. That's legalism. That's trying to put you under a set of rules that God never intended you to be under. Amen. Romans 10 talks about uh, the self-righteousness of people. People are trying to set their own standards and their own righteousness. And they put a list of rules. It's almost like a 12-step program. And we're going to get into that here a little bit later uh, in verse number 20, 21, 22, and 23. If you break one of those steps, then you feel like you've crashed and you just do the whole thing. You just go back into it full force and probably even double. Probably even double, falling back into the same thing that you tried to take those 12 steps to get out of. That is, if you make it legalism, if you make it legalism. Now, the basis for our freedom is found in the word therefore. In verse number 16, 
which refers to the previous verse. Verse number 15. You see in verse 16, let no man therefore judge you, referring back to verse number 15, talking about the one that spoiled principalities and powers, and he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He spoiled principalities. In other words, he disarmed the devil. To spoil something means to disarm or defeat. He spoiled the principalities. He made a show of them openly. In other words, he exposed Satan. He exposed his deceit and his violence. And then the Bible said triumphing uh, over them in it. Jesus defeated and disarmed Satan. Jesus returned to heaven in a great triumphal po procession. And you can read all about that in Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 8, 9, 10, and 11. When he disarmed the devil, he ascended back on high, is what Ephesians chapter number 4 says. Amen. So uh, the basis for our freedom is what Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Bottom line, the basis for our freedom is the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's called grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace, God's unmerited favor toward David Rowan. Just put your own name in there. God's unmerited favor toward you, toward mankind. That is pure grace, amen? Now think about this. Since the law... According to Romans chapter number 9 and verse number 4, since the law was only given to Israel, isn't it strange that anyone else would want to try to submit to it knowing that the Jews failed? Think about that. They failed. What makes you think you can keep it? And it wasn't even given to you. I can prove that of Romans 9 and also Romans 2. Gentiles having not the law did by nature the things contained in the law. Not having the law, it became a law to them, is what Romans chapter 2 says. Now, the person who judges a believer because that believer is not living under Jewish laws or the Ten Commandments. I've had people, and even in Bible studies, in the Bible study in the morning, uh, Brother Rowan, are you against the Ten Commandments? No, I'm not against the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were given by God. The Ten Commandments is the Word of God. You'll find them in Exodus chapter 20. Fact is, if you'll read the first five books of the law, you'll find uh, a few hundred more of them, of the commandments given by God. They're all good, they're all right, and they're all holy, you see. God, is, God has given His law, and the Bible says if we use that law lawfully, then it's good. What is the law used for? It's a schoolmaster to do what? According to Galatians 3, to bring us to Christ. A law, the law of God makes sin exceeding sinful. We know it's wrong to lie. We know it's wrong to cheat and steal. And we know it's wrong to murder. We know it's wrong to commit fornication and adultery. We know it's wrong to curse and use uh, uh, words idly. We shouldn't do that. You know what gets me about this cursing too, this cussing if you want to call it, cursing, cussing whatever it is. Now, a lot of people can refrain their tongue on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Bible study every morning, but when they get out of church, they have at it. You ought to watch your tongue. You, I mean, that's, that's, you ought to watch your tongue. Honest to goodness, if I was there, I believe I'd grab it and wring it. Amen? I, yeah, I can do it and get away with it. Nobody else can. Amen? All right? But now, you shouldn't do that. You should try to watch your mouth. Uh, so the law is good. The law is holy. Nothing wrong with the law. But my dear friend, you cannot keep the law. You have never been able to keep the law. The Jews couldn't keep the law. You can't keep the law. No man other than the perfect God-man ever kept the law. Let me show you something over here. Hold your place in Colossians. Go to Romans chapter 3. And I'm going to give you a good concrete verse about the law. <clears throat> the Bible says in verse 20 of Romans chapter 3, now, I don't, know how, I don't know how more clear, much more clear you can get uh, other than this verse con concerning the law saving someone. The Bible said, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall what? No flesh be justified in his sight, 
For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law did exactly what it's supposed to do. The law did it what it was supposed to do in my life. And if you're saved, the law did what it was supposed to do in your life. If you're not saved, maybe you just need another dose of the law. And these people that want to live by the law, you know how they're going to die? By the law. They're going to die by the law. And they'll never enter into heaven. You see, so the law was never meant to save. The law was to bring you to the one who can save you, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, now, there's not only, um, not only, first of all, uh, the basis for our freedom, but we see there's legalism in bondage. There, this is the second warning, actually, and it said there's bondage in legalism. Let no one tell you otherwise. There is bondage in legalism. Let me read to you a verse out of Galatians chapter number 5. Listen to verse number 1 of Galatians chapter 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You was not saved by the law. Why would you want to go back under the law? The law will only bring bondage is what Galatians chapter number 5 and verse number 1 says. Now we're talking about eating and drinking right here in Colossians chapter number 2. Not only partaking of certain foods, but even abstaining. Leve uh, Leviticus chapter number 11, certain foods, and you can go home and study that, write it down. Leviticus chapter number 11, there were certain foods that were classified clean or unclean. But did you know the Lord Jesus made it very, very clear that food is neutral? He said in the book of Matthew chapter 15, and uh, read the first 20 verses, but especially verse 11, verse 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, he talks about it's what comes out of your heart that defiles you. It's not what comes out of your mouth. What you put in your mouth is what comes out that defiles you. And then you can note in Acts chapter number 10, verse number 9 and following, you remember when Peter had the blanket vision, there was all manner of four-footed beasts and unclean beasts. And the Lord said, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, Not so, Lord. I've done three times. And he, never, he said, I've never eaten anything like that that's unclean. And the Lord said, What I've called clean, don't you want to call unclean? Of course, we understand the message. He was talking about the Gentiles. He went on down to the house of Cornelius and Cornelius got saved. But still we have... a picture there that what God made clean don't call unclean. And then you have in Galatians, and write these down, it'll help you. Galatians chapter number 2 verse 11 and following. And then 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. And let me read this one to you. 1 Corinthians chapter number 8 and verse 8. Uh, I believe this is what I want. Yeah, but meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better Neither if we eat not are we the worse. But there's, there is um, people that uh, will tell you if you eat a certain food, and mainly, and I can call their name, I, they're up in College Dale, Tennessee, is a big, big camp of them up there. It's, they're the Seventh-day Adventists. They'll tell you if you eat certain kinds of meat. Now here's something. Uh, there's, a big, um, there's a big school up in Crossville where I came from, the Seventh-day Adventists. There's a camp out there. And... Uh, so I decided to stop in their store one time and get me some healthy food. Uh, yeah, I did. I did. And uh, nevertheless, there was this sweet little lady that's always smiling and never, never angry. I've never seen her angry. And she said, what would you like? And I said, well, I don't know. What do you have? And she said, how about an egg sandwich? And I just stopped them. And I could have been a smart aleck, but I wasn't. I said, now you won't eat chicken, but you'll eat an egg. I was thinking that, you know, I was thinking this. But she was going to fix me an egg sandwich and then give me some of her vegetables. And I thought that was awful kind. But do you see how legalistic they become? You see how legalistic you can become if you're not careful, you see. So, so um, uh, if you feel you will be healthier by eating or not eating, then do it. Th then, then do it, but don't tell me how to eat. Amen? Yeah. A lot of people today who, and I, by the way, I've had open heart surgery, Brother Joe, so I, I've eaten a lot of gravy and biscuit and bacon in my lifetime. Uh, but nevertheless, if you want to be healthier, eat right. 
eat right. If you want a good quality of life, eat right. But it, your salvation is not going to depend on whether you eat hog meat or you don't eat hog meat. Amen? A lot of people today who have the same spirit as did the Pharisee make these things a test of spiritual living. Special days, Exodus chapter 20, verse 9, 10, and 11, Saturday Sabbaths and so on. Um, the foods according to Romans 14, Romans 15. I'm just giving you a lot of scripture that mention these things about food and special days. Uh, Leviticus 25 mentions several feast days that uh, you would have to keep under the Jewish law. Isaiah chapter number 1 and verse number 13 talks about new moon celebration. Now, all of this was good. All of it was good. You're saying all of it? Yes, it was. All of it was good because it pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. But Christ has already come and the law is fulfilled. He fulfilled the law. The law was a schoolmaster. We've already said that according to Galatians chapter number 3. And you ought to write this down and read it. Galatians 3, 24 all the way through chapter 4 and verse number 11. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, does that mean that the Old Testament law has no ministry to New Testament believers? No. No, not on your life. The law still reveals the holiness of God. And in the law, Jesus Christ can be seen. How do I know that? Well, the Bible says so. You can say that and be right. But in Luke chapter number 24, you remember verse 27? Where did Jesus begin expounding of himself to the Emmaus disciples? He began with Moses and all the prophets. So you can find Jesus Christ on any page in the Scripture. Any page on the Scripture, you can find him. And then... Uh, again, 1 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 8, if you were looking for that verse, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 8. The law still reveals sin and warns of the consequences of sin. Warns of the consequences of sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The soul that sinneth, it shall Die, die. You can find it all, especially in James chapter number 1, John chapter number 8, verse number 24, and on and on. But it has, the law reveals sin, but the law has no power to prevent sin, or did it ever have the power to redeem the sinner? The law points you to the one who did redeem 2,000 years ago, he bought the human race with his own blood and Jesus died and paid your sin penalty and debt and we need to keep preaching Christ. The law will show you that you're guilty, that you're exceeding guilty and sinful and Jesus Christ is the answer. Thank God we can't just leave you under the law. We don't have to leave you under the law. A preacher that's preaching the truth will use the law and then he'll bring you to the one who sets you free. Amen? And you can be made free when you trust him. All right, now let's look at the blessings of grace. The third warning. And remember these warning signs. So we won't walk into a prop. The third warning is do not go back into the shadows. Look at verse 17. Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. The law is but a shadow. The Bible even uh, mentions it in Hebrews chapter 10 and especially verse number one. It's a shadow. The, the sacrifice of the bulls and goats and the blood of bulls and goats was a shadow of things to come. The shadow of things to come. Now, my dear friend, you can't hug your mother's shadow. You need to hug your mother. You can't, you can't embrace a shadow. I need the real thing. The blood of bulls and goats and all the Old Testament system and sacrifices pointed me to the ultimate sacrifice, the death of and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary and his glorious resurrection. I embrace him. I have substance to step out on. I have someone to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I hope that you have embraced him and have accepted him as your personal savior. Why go back into the shadows when we have the clear light 
of reality. Now, let me say this. You know why that legalism is so popular? Legalism is popular. You can go just about in any given denomination here in the United States of America, here in the state of Florida, here in Santa Rosa County, and you can find people exercising different forms of legalism. Telling you that you have to do this. Telling you you have to do that. Get your hair cut. Uh, do this. You know, uh, take the earrings out. And I think you ought to do all that stuff after you get saved. Uh, you ought to look like a Christian. If you call yourself a Christian, you ought to look like one. Amen. You ought to look like a Christian. Act like one. Talk like one. But you don't need to do that to come to Christ. You have churches that will give their express forms of, of, of legalism. And the reason they do it, the reason they do it is the same exact reason that the Jews did it back in the New Testament. Turn over to Luke chapter 18. They do it today for the same reason. You can't convince me otherwise. And that is so you can measure your spiritual life and look down on others. If I'm going to put a set of rules and regulations upon the board and I'm going to adhere to those rules and regulations of whether it be Baptist legalism or, or Judaism or whatever it may be, uh, any church, I don't care who it is, that puts, that puts uh, uh, rules and regulations uh, as far as you to obey to find audience with God. I'm going to say more about rules and regulations. Nothing wrong with rules and regulations except if you're trying to keep those rules and regulations to gain audience with a holy God. All right, now, in Luke chapter number 18, verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. I've tried to find this, and maybe you can find it. I can't find where any command in the Scripture was ever, ever given to fast twice in the week. It, I'm not going to say it's not in there, but I can't find it. I can't find I believe he's going a little bit overboard here, don't you? I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Well, that's why people are doing the same thing today, to try to make themselves look better than others. So they can look down on other people. A true Christian's attitude is to show the world what Christ can do in us and through us. Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 16, Let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Amen. Ephesians 4 and verse 13, till we all come in the unity of faith. All right, now let's look at verse number 18 and 19. All right, verse 18 and 19, we have another warning. Let no man beguile you of your reward. Beguile means to declare unworthy of a prize. It's simply a picture of an umpire or a judge that's disqualifying someone because he is not obeyed the rules. These false teachers were acting on a false humility saying, I'm not good enough to come directly to God. False humility. You, you, ever, you, you ever listen to the preacher, well, I know I can't preach and I can't pray and I can't sing, but I'm going to sing anyway. False humility. <laughs> we used to have singings up in Tennessee, Brother Joe. You ever been to a singing? We used to have singings every Friday night. And um, uh, I had these two gals come. I mean, we had probably four or five hundred people there at singing. We had the primitive quartet up, and, and uh, we'd have some pretty big groups up back years ago. And um, 
Anyway, I had these two girls come in, and I, I'd say they was in their 40s, and they sit on the front row, and they was both dressed just alike in polka dot dresses, had a bow on and all the frills, and they, well, the Lord just lighted on my heart to sing. I can't sing good, but I'm going to sing. I thought, dear God. Honest to goodness. I mean, stop it right there. False humility. If God's called you to preach, get up here and preach. If God's called you to sing, get up here and sing. If God's called you to testify, testify or teach, teach. This false humility, the Bible warns against it and these false teachers were full of it. If you'll notice right here, um, they, um, they, were, they, were, they were saying, I'm not good enough to come directly to God, so I'm going to start through one of the angels. And then they're going to try to reach God through anyone or anything other than Jesus Christ. You know what that is? It's called idolatry. You know what a lot of people are doing today to try to get to Jesus Christ? Go through Mary. That's, that's false, brother, that's false humility. I'm not good enough to get to Christ, so I'm just... They, these false teachers doing exactly the same thing. Jesus said in John chapter number 14, verse number 6, I am the what? The way, the truth, and the... No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. Only, the only way you're going to gain audience with the Holy God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, anyway, by way of information, um, by way of just way of information, if you want to read verse number 18 and 19, that's talking about the principalities and the angels they were trying to go through. Um, but Hebrews chapter number 1, verse number 14, for your information, angels are our servants, according to that verse. So we don't go through an angel to get to Christ. We, we, go, we go through Christ to get to a holy God. Amen. All right, now false teachers form a man-made religion with rules of their own choosing and only puffs up his ego by his own fleshly mind. Now, if you'll notice in verse number 19, the Bible said in Colossians chapter 2, and, holding, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands of nourishment ministered and knit together increasing with the increase of God. These false teachers were not holding to the head, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore... They were spiritually undernourished. We draw on spiritual nourishment that only comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, and we grow as a body of believers. According to Ephesians chapter number 2, we grow, we're fitly joined together, and we grow into a holy temple uh, where the Lord, actually the Holy Spirit dwells uh, in our midst, collectively and individually. It's what Ephesians chapter 2 said. Now, there's so many lodges and clubs and churches that are attracting people and being initiated into inner secrets and having contact with the spirit world. And it sounds all exciting to the carnal mind, but God soundly condemns these practices. And Paul is warning us against such practices. And then he says there in verse number 20 through 23, and closing real quickly, uh, uh, of course, talking about being enslaved. Paul has already condemned legalism. He's already condemned mysticism, as we talked about uh, principalities and angels. Now he's condemning asceticism. Asceticism. I don't know why we have all these words for different cults, but asceticism. Asceticism is simply self-denial Self-control by inflicting discomfort on oneself. That was real popular during the Middle Ages. I read during the Middle Ages they would wear uh, shirts of goat's hair next to their skin. And they would sleep on hard beds and they would whip oneself. And they would whip their self. And they wouldn't speak for days and even months. Wouldn't speak. And so they were inflicting pain. That's called asceticism. They were trying to uh, trying to promote themselves and become more spiritual by flogging themselves. Did you know even the, in the Catholic Church, the Carmelite order of priests do the same thing? They, they, they have a flogging stick and they just beat themselves to death. I'd, I'd be so black and blue, I'd ha, I'd, I wouldn't be able to preach if I had to beat myself to death every time I thought something bad or something like that. 
Well, that's, that's asceticism. That's what it is. It's asceticism. Um, and it was real. Again, it was very popular during the Middle Ages, but people are even doing it today. Verse 21, it says, touch not, taste not, handle not. Now, this is man's life, man's life wrapped up in a system of rules. Now, we admit this. I said I was going to say something, and bear with me. We admit that discipline is needed in our lives, but our soul is not sanctified by human discipline. It's only by a new birth in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in verse number 20, this life, this type of life has to do with the rudiments of the world. And rudiments was mentioned in verse number 8 of Colossians 2 as well. And rudiments is simply the ABCs of something. That is physically or mentally following a set of order of rules to gain audience with a holy God. I'm going to put these rules up. I'm going to do this so I can gain audience with God. Now, nothing wrong with rules, but why do we keep these rules? The only way we keep rules is to be born again and keep under our body. And let me tell you something about keeping rules. It's not adhering to an, a bunch of external rules. It's a Holy Spirit in you that produces a brand new desire. Amen. That's what it is. That's what salvation is. A brand new desire to stay out of trouble and to stay out of out of filth and things like that. Now, these, these rules Paul warned us of were not of God, here in verse 22, but they were of men, foods and so forth, things like that. To deny, to keep from hurting a weaker Christian is one thing, but don't claim it makes you more spiritual. Read Romans 14, verse number 6. Um, if, 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 if someone came to my house, I knew that they were just coming out of Judaism I'm, I'm not going to have my wife fix, a, fix pork chops. Amen? I, I'll have some gefilte fish or something. I don't know. I don't know. But, but I, you know, I, I'll do it right. I, I'm not going to offend a weaker Christian. But don't think that it makes you more spiritual. And read, again, read Romans chapter number 14, verse number 6. Verse 23, right here we're closing. Verse 23, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and all will worship. This kind of life that Paul speaks of is deceptive, that it's, it's self-imposed, it's self-will worship. It is not true worship of God, which must be, according to John 4, 24, in spirit and in truth. Their harsh discipline does nothing for the inner man. The power of Christ in the life of the believer does more than merely restrain the desires of the flesh, it puts a new desire within that born-again believer. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4 bears witness to this. We are partakers of the divine nature. So it's God in us, working through us. Verse 23, it ends by saying, not in honor to the satisfying of the flesh. These people that Paul are warning us against, this false doctrine of asceticism, I think I said it right, Asceticism. This false doctrine that he's warning us about, they're not honoring their bodies. They're abusing their bodies. They're abusing their bodies of the necessary foods and rest that they need to honor God. And usually, this type of life brings out the worst instead of the best in at least two ways. Listen to me. If you try to adhere to a set of rules... And dishonor your own self by, by, by keeping yourself from certain things that you need. It can, it can be harmful in two ways. It can hurt your attitude toward other people into making you think that you're better than they are. Number two, it can cause overindulgence of those things that you've been deprived of. There's coming a time when you're going to snap. And you're going to go back and you're going to get seven more devils more wicked than the first. And that's what's going to happen to your life. If that's what you're adhering to to get you to heaven. Because I've seen it. I've seen it in people. They try some. I just read. I just read. Brother Gray, this is what I was going to tell you. And you'll know who I'm speaking of. I've, I've got it. I just read where an evangelist of 23 years said he's... He's sick and tired of fundamentalism. And he's out of the ministry as of June 2015. You know who he was talking about the other day? That's him. 
22 years. 22 years ago, I had him at my church in Tennessee. 22 years ago, I had him at my church in Tennessee preaching and was trying to help him in every way that I could. I, I got born again in his presence. It blew his mind. I got, I got saved. I mean, I got saved. My message changed. My life changed. My heart changed. My attitude changed. And I have a message for the world. And he kept talking and he almost got in. He, when I say he almost got in, he entertained that what happened to me may have been true. But Brother Grady knows this to be true. When it was all said and done, he said, I can't fellowship with you anymore, Brother Rowan. That's what he said. Do you know he's out of the ministry today? I'm going to tell you what rules will do to you. Rules... And I'll, rules are good. Discipline's good. We have to have rules. We have to have rules. But when I'm talking about rules in Colossians chapter 2, I'm talking about rules that people keep in order to gain audience with a holy God. They don't exist. Jesus' blood and all of the ordinances, the handwriting of ordinances that was against you was taken out of the way and nailed to his cross. Amen. Thank God we can go to Christ. But friend, that's what, can, that's what this can do to you if you try to keep rules and you keep trying to keep rules, you keep trying to keep rules to please a holy God, you're going to wake up in hell one day and you don't want to do that. The only way you're going to get saved is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Only Jesus Christ can fill the void, righteousness, peace, quietness, and assurance. And you know what that does? Only the Lord can give you that wonderful, wonderful balance of life that we need as Christians. Amen. God bless you. I'm through. Let's stand to our feet.